a number of months, and I believe it was maybe six or seven months, the number of arrests that had gone up for uh, marijuana-related arrests while driving in a vehicle had gone up uh, somewhere close to 70 percent. He told me that older kids had given it to him when he was in middle school, and they got it from mar medical marijuana dispensaries. Not only that, they also uh, sell marijuana, and uh, many of the students get expelled because of uh, the sales of marijuana on campus. I think by expanding the limits around schools and daycare centers, what we're saying is that there's something inherently dangerous or bad about these shops. And I just, I just really disagree with that premise. That kills people's voice because 85% of the people live nearby within the 600 block, they said, no, thank you. Stay away from our kids. Stay away from our residential area. But yet, Welcome to Zooming In, I'm Simone Gao. Since the beginning of the 20th century, most countries, including America, have enacted laws against cultivation, possession, or transfer of cannabis, a formal name for marijuana. But towards the end of the 20th century, decriminalization of the herb began. However, when California pioneered the legalization of medical marijuana in 1996, few people thought it would lead to the legalization of recreational marijuana 20 years later. Now the legalization of recreational marijuana is old news, and safe injection centers are showing up that allow people to legally inject illicit drugs under supervision. So, what's next? Is the U.S. entering a trap to legalizing all drugs, and is California leading the way? Let's find out in this series of Zooming In. It was a devastating scene on Interstate 880 in Fremont. Five mangled cars, three people dead, one driver under arrest. 21-year-old Dang Tran is in jail, suspected of driving under the influence of marijuana. This is not the only major traffic accident induced by marijuana a year into its legalization in California. On the morning of December 2, 2017, a truck crashed into the San Francisco Bay Bridge toll station, killing the toll collector. The California Highway Patrol said they smelled marijuana and alcohol on the driver. On Christmas Eve the same year, California Highway Patrol officer Andrew Camilleri died when a car rear-ended him going over 100 miles per hour on I-880. The driver later admitted being under the influence of marijuana. And I believe the number was, at least in the Bay Area, I, I believe this was just in the Bay Area and not statewide, uh, but the number of arrests that were made um, in a number of months, and I believe it was maybe six or seven months, the number of arrests that had gone up for uh, marijuana-related arrests while driving in a vehicle had gone up uh, somewhere close to 70 percent, which was substantial. It's a, a significant number. It's a common conception that marijuana makes a driver calm and relaxed, but what it actually does to the human body remains uncertain. According to the FDA, although chemicals in marijuana have led to two FDA-approved medications in pill form, the marijuana plant is not an FDA-approved medicine. Researchers haven't conducted even large-scale clinical trials to show that benefits of the marijuana plant outweigh its risks to patients. Dr. Christy Brown, a retired Mission College professor in Santa Clara, has experienced the risks firsthand. Her 26-year-old son started using the substance when he was 14. 
I found out that it wasn't just that he was using it once in a while, he was using it like every day. He was using it before he went to school and I didn't know that, you know, he would, he would appear to be, you know, like, okay, but then when I, found, when I would go pick him up at school, this is before he got his driver's license, I would say, well, how did, you know, what did you do in your class, you know, just to, you know, make conversation and he couldn't remember. So he had been, and then I found out later, it was a couple of years later, he told me that he had been using it before he was in class and he wasn't really paying attention in class. And then he would have to call his friends to find out what his assignment was at homework. So I'm a teacher and I basically tried to help him um, with his assignments when he had problems, but I noticed he wouldn't have any focus on his assignments, he couldn't keep his attention. Um, he the symptoms Dr. Brown described can be explained scientifically. Dr. Evelyn Lee, a cardiologist at the Asian Medical Clinic, showed us the difference between a normal brain and a substance-impaired brain. Yeah. This is a normal brain. Mm -hmm. And this is the shooting from the top okay. to the bottom, and this is from the bottom to the top. It's like looking from the bottom of the human being to the top. Mm. As you can see, if you drink alcohol, you start having holes in the brain. Holes in the brain means that those cells are dead. Are dead? Dead. They are no longer alive. They're mm. dead. You know, so you see holes in the brain. Mm. Like this is normal. You see, you see no holes here. Yeah. And you see a lot of holes here for people who use just a f three years of cocaine. You see a lot of holes here. Wow. And this is met methamphetamine, okay? You got holes here. And this is marijuana. You see a lot of holes. Well, even... A lot of holes with marijuana. Okay. So, so that means this that... This is just for uh, taking marijuana for two years, right? This is for two years, age of 16. Wow. There are a lot of cells that are dead. Yeah, they're dead. Uh, what it does is that it affects the frontal lobe and then the hippocampus. The frontal lobe is where we people, where people uh, use it for creativities, uh, for social interactions. Uh, the hippocampus is for memory. And so people who use this drug will be affected by how they react. As of April 2018, four months since California began issuing temporary state licenses to cannabis operators, there are nearly 6,000 licensed cannabis businesses in the state. California is the first state in the U.S. to legalize recreational marijuana use. Coming up, all licensed retailers and individuals are only permitted to sell cannabis to adults 21 and older, but rampant marijuana use is present on middle school and high school campuses. Stay tuned to find out how this happened. Dr. Brown has two sons. The older one grew up in Texas. He graduated high school with honors and got a law degree from Rice University. He now enjoys a successful career as a diplomat. She never expected that her younger son, born and raised in California, would take a drastically different path. He told me that older kids had given it to him when he was in middle school and they got it from mar medical marijuana dispensaries. Medical marijuana had long been legalized in California by the time Dr. Brown's son started using it. But adults from 18 to 21 can only get medical marijuana through their primary caregiver, theoretically. They went to a doctor and they would say, I can't sleep or I have some pain. And the doctor can't really test for that. And it's not their regular doctor. It was a what they call pot doctors. Oh. So it was kind of, you know, basically everybody knew this was kind of a scam. It is a scam that doesn't seem to bother most people. After all, marijuana is generally perceived as a non-harmful herb that makes you feel good. It's right for you. Medical marijuana is not addictive and non-habit forming. Medical relief can be administered instantaneously. Side effects can include euphoria, a sense of well-being, love, and extreme happiness. According to the Monitoring the Future study, among all grades, perceptions of harm and disapproval of marijuana use 
has continued to decrease over the past 20 years. Because all of the other kids were doing it, he thought he didn't have a problem. This whole culture of, you know, it's okay. Marijuana is not harmful. You know, you can do these things and, and um, you know, um, it's going to be legal soon anyway. And that's another thing that he would say. Um, it's not harmful. I can't die. I can't overdose. Those kind of things he used to give me as kind of reasons why it was okay for him to do it. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, marijuana use can lead to problems, which takes the form of addiction in severe cases. 30% of those who use marijuana may have some degree of marijuana use disorder. People who begin using marijuana before the age of 18 are four and seven times more likely to develop a marijuana use disorder than adults. Dr. Brown's son falls into this category. He got increasingly addicted to marijuana in his high school years when he used it multiple times a day. He progressed to running away from home to avoid treatment and getting arrested for bringing marijuana to school. By the time he was approaching 18, Dr. Brown had to face a bigger challenge. We told him, you know, when you get to be 18 in California, you can get a medical marijuana card and you can use medical marijuana. This was true before legalization. And a lot of uh, friends of his were talking about getting these cards so they could use marijuana recreationally. When Dr. Brown's son turned 18, she realized that reality was worse than what she originally feared. I found out he was actually um, hanging around these marijuana dispensaries and he started working for someone who grew marijuana. And he started making money actually by making hash oil. And um, it's a very dangerous thing because you have to use butane. And there's a lot of um, hash oil explosions where um, I've, I've read about them that they've had explosions where houses have burned down, people have been killed. And <clears throat> it actually became illegal in California. On November 8, 2016, recreational marijuana was legalized in California. Marijuana dispensaries sprawled in metropolitan areas in Southern and Northern California. Schools quickly felt their presence. The Fremont United School District is one of Northern California's star districts. It is made up of 42 schools serving nearly 35,000 students in grades K through 12. It had 14 National Merit Scholars and 11 California Gold Ribbon Schools in 2016. Since late 2016, the district councilor, Yang Xiao, saw a distinct change. After uh, the adult recreational marijuana was legalized uh, two years ago, the school district has been collecting data on how rampant uh, the uh, marijuana abuse is on our campuses. And data shows that uh, there's at least a 12% increase on average for the last three years which indicates that more and more students are using marijuana on campus. Not only that, they also uh, sell marijuana, and uh, many of the students get expelled because of uh, the sales of marijuana on campus. According to Marijuana Business Daily, as of July 2018, an estimated 70% of cities and counties in California had actually prohibited cannabis companies of any type from setting up shop in their jurisdictions, but major metropolitan areas are exceptions. On November 28, 2017, at the San Francisco Board of Supervisors meeting, Katie Tung tried three times to impose a buffer zone for marijuana dispensaries, drug dispensaries, and daycares. They were all turned down. So the first one is the 1,000-foot uh, buffer zone and including daycare center as and defined under the California Health and Safety Code. Okay, no other questions about this particular amendment. Madam Clerk, on the item, please call the roll. Supervisor Breed. No. Breed, no. Supervisor Cohen. No. Cohen, no. Supervisor Farrell. Farrell, no. Supervisor Fewer. Fewer, no. Supervisor Kim. Aye. Kim, aye. Supervisor Peskin. No. Peskin, no. Supervisor Ronan. Ronan, no. Supervisor Safai? Aye. Safai, aye. Supervisor Sheehy? No. Sheehy, no. Supervisor Tang? 
Aye. Tang, aye. Supervisor Yi. Aye. Yi, aye. There are four ayes and seven noes with Supervisors Breed, Cohen, Farrell, Fewer, Peskin, Ronan, and she, he in the dissent. The amendment fails. Given that that previous motion failed, I just wanted to put it back to a thousand foot radius without daycare centers, which is what we have right now. There are five ayes and six noes with Supervisors Breed, Cohen, Farrell, Peskin, Ronan, and Sheehy in the dissent. The motion fails. Supervisor Tang. Okay, thank you. I promise this will be the last one on the buffer zone. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. So my next, um, my next motion then would be 600 feet buffer zone. Ye, I. There are five eyes and six noes with Supervisors Breed, Cohen, Farrell, Peskin, Ronan, and Sheehy in the dissent. The amendment fails. Supervisor Tong's motions were not only turned down, her colleagues passionately disagreed with them. I think by expanding the limits around schools and daycare centers, what we're saying is that there's something inherently dangerous or bad about these shops. And I just, I just really disagree with that premise. I, I actually think that the war on drugs has been what has been dangerous for our society. There is documented evidence, plenty of it, showing that where you make drugs legal and regulate them and prevent kids from getting access to them and allow people who are already uh, addicted to substances, you know, to uh, not penalize those individuals, that they use less drugs and get better, and that neighborhoods get safer. And, you know, in Portugal, where all drugs are, are legal, they've seen uh, the society transformed and crime go down. And I feel At that like meeting, Supervisor Ronan's motion to remove any restrictions on the distance between cannabis dispensaries was passed. However, Ellen Lee Jo social worker and 2018 candidate for San Francisco special mayoral election, said Ronan does not represent the community's real voice. I was in many of the public hearings. I remember clearly in my head. We said it to them, we do not want a cannabis store next to 3015 San Bruno because there's a preschool and a daycare right next to that proposed location. You know what they say? They said it is necessity to have a cannabis store that kills people's voice because 85% of the people live nearby within the 600 block. They said, no, thank you. Stay away from our kids. Stay away from our residential area. But yet, they pass the regulation. They allow them to have a cannabis store right next to daycare. Before the mayoral election, according to political contributions reported to the San Francisco Ethics Commission, San Francisco Supervisor Mark Farrell and Board of Supervisors President London Breed, who was last elected mayor of the city, had received more than $50,000 each in reported political contributions from the local cannabis industry. In total, the members of the current Board of Supervisors received at least $153,000 from owners, employees, lobbyists, and firms associated with the cannabis industry in San Francisco. Coming up, what will legalization of recreational marijuana lead to? Dr. Brown's son eventually moved on to more serious drugs when he was a freshman in college. His family tried their best to help him control the addiction. He could control it for a while, but he always relapsed. At the end of each cycle, he would be in an even worse situation. So when um, he had to withdraw from school, that was a big shock for him because he didn't, you know, he, that was his status in life and he was going to college and you know, all his other friends were still in college, and um, he just kind of went crazy. We found out he was also using um, opiate pills. And then we found out that he was starting to use heroin, and he was starting to inject heroin. So it was very, very quick, you know, from going to college, going into these other drugs, and then becoming a full-blown heroiner. 
uh, addict. He ended up also developing drug-induced psychosis and was sent to mental health institutions for a while. After being arrested for driving under the influence, his mother discovered a surprising fact about him. I was really worried. I hired a lawyer to, you know, find out what was going to go on. And the lawyer went to see him. And I told him, you know, he's, he's mentally ill, he's psychotic. And the lawyer went and he said to me, you know, there's nothing wrong with your son. He's okay. And I said, really? We went to see him and he actually, be, you know, he had been taking this medical marijuana for like four months and exhibiting these signs of psychosis. We went to the jail and he was fine. After 24 hours of not using marijuana, he was himself, basically. So I thought, you know, when they tell you that this is a disease and it should not be law enforcement that deal with people, it should just be the health providers that deal with addicted people, it, it's really not going to work because the psychiatrist couldn't deal with him. He was too out of control. There are some cases where the only people that are going to be able to deal with um, a, a person who's in an out of control, addicted situation is law enforcement, unfortunately. Between law enforcement and the persistent efforts of his family, Dr. Brown's son was able to finally stop using drugs and graduate from college. Dr. Brown, however, is aware that the battle is not over. Anytime he's exposed to a drug accessible environment, he's in danger of relapsing. On August 21st, 2018, the California State Senate passed a measure that would authorize San Francisco to open a facility for injecting illegal drugs, the first of its kind in the nation. Eight days later, a mock injection center was open. One of the critiques of the injection center was that law enforcement would potentially no longer be able to arrest people who possess drugs because they could simply say they are on their way to the safe injection center. For the Brown family, it means they will have one more thing to watch out for. Dr. Brown is a lifelong Democrat, and she still is. She voted for legalizing medical marijuana, believing the herb is a necessary treatment for a small group of terminal disease patients. When her students told her high schoolers were selling marijuana to younger kids, she didn't believe it until her own son became a victim. To her, drug policy is not a partisan issue, but a common sense issue. She told me if she knew all the facts that were hidden about marijuana, she would never have voted for legalizing medical marijuana. Now, California is likely to see a boom of injection centers in the near future. Will the debate over it be about two contrasting government philosophies, or does it really come down to basic common sense? Let's find out in part two of this series. Is California pioneering legalizing all drugs? Thanks for watching Zooming In. I'm Simone Gao, and see you next week.